I was recently on a um, Zoom meeting with Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, whose anthologies, including uh, one called Jewish Wisdom, are often used at our Lunch and Learn. Now, Telushkin shared with us a story about a person who was in need, who approached a rabbi for some help right before Passover. Rabbi, please help me with a little tzedakah so I can purchase milk for Passover. The rabbi gave him 25 rubies. 25 rubles, which was a considerable amount, the equivalent of about two months' salary for a laborer. The rabbi's students questioned him, why did you give him so much when all he asked for was money for milk? The rabbi answered, well, he asked for money for milk, for milk, for money for milk. That meant he wasn't able to afford meat for Passover. And a Seder would have been milchik, not much of a Seder at all. And if he didn't have enough for Pesach, imagine what his family had to eat the rest of the year. Therefore, I wanted to give him enough to have a good Passover, a Seder for him and his family, and to help his hungry family. The lesson is one of moral imagination. That is, responding to the real needs of a situation. Understanding the depth of the unspoken pain and suffering that afflict people. Moral imagination is our attempt to find solutions, or at least to provide support that goes beyond the superficial. Moral imagination has nothing to do with how much we give. Rather, it is our attentiveness to the causes of the suffering. It is much more than sympathy. It is empathy. Sympathy is a sense of pity for another person. Empathy is finding a feeling of connection with that person. Sympathy is a form of what Martin Buber might classify as an I-it relationship, an objectification of the other. Empathy is an I-thou relationship. You feel a kinship with that person. It is imagining that you can actually feel what another person is experiencing. At the core of that attentiveness is the sense of connectedness with one another. In Judaism, the ideal fulfillment is found not as an individual in isolation, but in the embrace of community, family, and nation. It is through our relationships with family and friends and community. We establish a point of reference and relevance, the background and setting of our identity, purpose, and meaning. It is with community that we turn when we are down and struggling. When we reach one of those low points, it is the mitzvah, the moral obligation of family, friends, and community to extend helping hands to those in need, hands filled with physical acts, emotional and spiritual support, acts that affirm the value and dignity of each person's life. We just read from the Torah that passage from the book of Deuteronomy, Atem Nitzavim Hayom, you stand this day, all of you, before Adonai, your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, every Israelite, men, women, and children, the strangers in your camp, from the wood choppers to those who carry your water, all of you are here to enter into the sworn covenant which Adonai makes with you this day, the Brit in order that you may be established as God's people, and Adonai will be your God. No one is left out. Last night for Kol Nidre, we stood up with three Torahs, and we gave permission that no one, no matter how far they transgressed, would be welcomed back. We know that there are people who feel that 
well, I don't observe anymore. I haven't been a member. I have been estranged. And they feel estranged, and they make themselves distant, and then they're lost. On the holiest day of the year, we say, Atem Netzabim, come and join us. The Torah's definition of our people includes all of those in our family and community. We should feel rightly proud of that, that inclusive tradition, one that is at the core of what it means to be a reformed Jew. As such, we are motivated to consider those who may not feel so welcome or included. So we must broaden our perspective in order to see those who may have fallen under our radar, those who need our help and our attention. And they will only be seen if we expand our moral imaginations. This morning, I want to highlight some of the extraordinary ways in which Temple Sinai members, in which you are reaching out and making a positive difference, how you are demonstrating the highest ideal of moral imagination. Arguably, the greatest health challenge facing society today is not COVID. It's mental wellness. The statistics are overwhelming. According to the CDC, one in five adults will experience a mental illness in a given year. One in five. One in five children, either currently or at some point during their life, will have had a serious, debilitating mental illness. And one in 25 Americans lives with a serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. And for every person suffering a mental illness, there is an extended family and friends who are heroically supporting and struggling to help. Now, one would think that with the enormous impact mental illness has had on families, this nation would do more to help. It goes without saying that we need to become stronger advocates for increasing our government funding for treatment centers and facilities, for research and financial aid to help relieve the crushing stress on family. They won't do it without our voice. They won't do it without our nudge. At Temple Sinai, we find many heroes who are helping to address the challenges of mental health and many other important social issues. This morning of Yom Kippur, I want to mention a few because they are, for me, and I hope for you, inspiring role models. Diane Cushman Neal and her husband Scott Neal established the Cushman Neal Family Wellness Fund. It was created to provide Temple Sinai community with education, support, and tools to face dire challenges such as stress and anxiety, not having access to food or hygienic products. And in partnership with Jewish Family Service, the Cushman Neal Family Wellness Fund will help to provide one-on-one -on -one counseling, wellness and educational panels, caregiver support, and grief support. It will also help to ensure that children experiencing learning differences are warmly and sensitively included in our school and our community. Temple Sinai is at the cutting edge of synagogues in this community and indeed around the nation for providing these resources and in great part thanks to the Cushman Neal family. They've also created the, do the Donations for Dignity, which is providing hygienic supplies for tens of thousands of people here in Colorado who can't afford health products. Now hear this, 43% of women in Colorado cannot afford feminine hygiene products, 43%. 53% struggle to get basic hygiene products such as soap, toilet paper, and diapers. Now imagine if you're a high school child and you don't have these products. When the time comes, they feel embarrassed. They don't have that sense of confidence and respect, and so they stay home, exacerbating a situation. Around hundreds of schools already 
are the donations for dignity that are helping to alleviate that, that crisis. Note that in addition to today's donation for food, and that truck was full by the time I was here at 8 in the morning, that in addition to that food, which will go to the Jewish Family Service Weinberger Food Pantry, many of us brought hygienic products for donations for dignity. And those barrels were pretty full when I got here, too. At Temple Sinai's entrance, you'll see two pink barrels for us to put those products for, to help those in need. And it's not just for Yom Kippur. They'll be there year-round because the need is year-round. We have had hundreds of Temple Sinai volunteers at Temple Sinai and throughout the community packaging hygienic products for women. In the coming year, I hope that you too will consider participating in these packing parties. They put together these hygienic products and they are placed in bathrooms around schools and organizations so that people can have them for free. Leadership of moral imagination has also been blessedly demonstrated by Marshall and Helene Abrams. Through their support for enhanced security at Temple Sinai and in countless other ways. In fact, they were the first to approach me when we were building the new school that Sinai needed to better protect our children and our families through physical structure of the building and by hiring professional guards. And you see evidence of that today and every other day that you come to Temple Sinai. In turn, each Temple Sinai member contributes to the security fund through fees and dues. When it was first enacted, I didn't know what the reaction would be. Well, you responded with a concern for the safety and welfare for all. And we are reaping that benefit today. There's an anonymous donor who has made extraordinary financial contributions to the security fund. He's also helped us to establish a fund that will provide financial support for our preschool teachers, hardworking people who are not making nearly as much as we hope that they could. Through our dues and fees, we pay them better than our other teachers in the community. But is it a living wage? It's a stretch. Our financial support that goes beyond that was made possible by anonymous donors. And hopefully you too, but I'm not going to make a pitch. <laughs> Another anonymous donor, and many of you, contributed to help the victims of the disastrous Marshall Fire this past January. That, that affected Temple Sinai members, and I know how grateful they are for your outpouring. And there are all, these are all leaders who are role modeling the highest values of Judaism. Gimelut chasadim, loving kindness and tzedakah, charity and social justice. The list goes on. This community is blessed to have the exemplars of tzedakah like Max and Elaine Apple, who, in addition to providing crucial help for Temple Sinai and Jewish Family Service, also benefit organizations like Firefly, which serves families with loved ones who have autism, and Clinica Tepiak which provides medical help for the undocumented people in this community. And when the Russians invaded Ukraine, forcing hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians to flee Poland and other countries, Temple Sinai members connected with the JCC in Krakow in order, we got together in order to raise funds to help them feed and house the refugees with Max and Elaine, Apple's help, and so many others leading the way, our congregation, our individual congregation, contributed nearly $100,000 to help the Ukrainians. Speaking of which, I was asked by Jay Streer, the head of Jewish Colorado, to make sure that we are all aware that there's a special campaign for, to try to raise funds as a part of a national multi-million dollar campaign to aid the Jewish refugees from Ukraine. As thousands try to escape Ukraine and Russia because of Putin's brutal attack, we are organizing planes and other transportation to bring them to safety. Right now, every plane heading from Russia to Israel is booked up through November. People are desperate to get out. and. That's expensive to get them out. It's expensive to house them. It's expensive to feed them. It's expensive to help them find a, a place of refuge. 
And so this campaign, as you'll find in your mailbox and emails, I hope that you'll respond with moral imagination. Because there, but for the grace of God, go I. How many of us, as we watched that three-part series by Ken Burns and PBS, looked at that and realized that there were some of our mishpacha from Ukraine, from Hungary, in Germany, in Austria, in Poland. Some were refugees who made it, and we're their descendants. Many did not. We can make a difference and save lives. We are also concurrently helping the remnant of the Jews of Ethiopia, Jews who are trying to escape the civil war there that is ravaging that country. Ethiopian Jews are desperate to join loved ones and live in peace in Israel. This federation campaign is pledging 100% of the funds that will go to the refugee efforts. So please look for that information. I want to go back to some other heroes in this congregation. Here's a group of Temple Sinai members who have established the remarkable 100 plus Jews who care fund. Jeff Robbins, David Frieder, Debbie Fendrick, Mark Reisner are among the leaders of this organization and creators of this organization, which now has some 228 contributing members from Sinai and around the community. Last year, they distributed close to $90,000 to 11 Denver and Boulder nonprofit organizations. Every few months or so, the members vote to support worthy projects and organizations that are helping people in need, both Jewish and not Jewish. Each of you are welcome to join, to contribute, and to make a difference. Moral imagination is demonstrated at the highest level by those who go out and personally make a difference in the lives of others. We have so many groups that are doing this blessed work, and I beg you to forgive me for not being able to name every one of you, but I want to highlight at least a few more. Paul and Susan Levine have organized dozens of Temple Sinai members who prepare lunches for the homeless and others who are suffering from food insecurity Every week, our members, you, prepare hundreds of lunches. Paul and Susan bring those lunches to Metro Caring to feed the hungry. In addition, they organize a group of Sinai members to distribute clothes and scarves and mittens and other necessary supplies for the homeless and poor as our participation in the annual Christmas mitzvah project. After the high holidays, we'll be collecting again and looking for volunteers. Again, look for information in the Sinai emails and website. I know some of you say, oh, we get too many emails. No, you don't. <laughs> There's lots of good stuff there. One cannot speak of hands-on difference makers without mentioning Jerry and Natalie Lassau and the many Temple Sinai members who make up our caring committee. Nancy Eisenberg is the chairperson. And in addition to the last hours we mentioned, Grace Bach and Mimi Barnard and Vicki Baker and Wendy Glasser, Debbie Hostetler and Bobby Kramer and Lori Lavenhar and Barbara Lettis and Diane Cushman Neal and Stephanie Podolak and Sharon Sloan and Joyce Spiegler and Wendy Veen and Win Linda Weinstein. And I know I had a long list, and there'll be still people come up to me and say, Rick, you forgot this one and that one and the other, and I'm sorry. What do they do? They deliver packages with loving support, welcoming new families, new babies, and bringing comfort to those who are going through illness or loss. Moral imagination certainly includes those like Lisa and Steve Friedman, who are our representatives with Habitat for Humanity, helping to provide housing for families in need. And Temple Sinai members like Bobby and Mark Kramer, who just shared the hafra, and Susan and Alan Markman. Alan, feel better. Gary and Nancy Eisenberg, and Margie Rashti, and Barbara Glassman, along with so many others, who rush to the aid of others in this community. And we are blessed as well with the fact that the vast majority of our B'nai Mitzvah students dedicate time and energy to mitzvah projects that touch the lives of people locally and sometimes even globally. The kids are great. 
and special kudos to their parents and their families who encourage them and role model for them what it means to be a mensch. Speaking of which, one of our recent Conferman students who's working on becoming an Eagle Scout, Joshua Weiner, organized a whole team of friends and family to build a garden platform for our preschool kids. You can go see that out uh, along the fence by the preschool. It was the hottest day of the year. They're out there schwitzing and schlepping and making it happen. For themselves, no. To make a positive difference, moral imagination. Again, forgive me for cutting short my listing of the members of Temple Sinai for doing acts of gimelut chasadim, for doing acts of loving kindness that help others. In truth, every single person here should be considered a participant in the mitzvah of moral imagination, responding to another's needs. Acts of loving kindness are made in simple and quiet ways. For instance, when we pause to listen and respond sensitively to another. After years of separation and disconnection, the loving act of warmly listening and responding is a blessing. On Rosh Hashanah, I spoke of the wisdom we find in the metaphorical stories of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. To conclude this morning's message on moral imagination and loving kindness, I want to refer back to a passage about Adam and Eve that is found in an ancient Jewish book that has been all but lost to us. The book is The Life of Adam and Eve, and it's found in the Pseudepigrapha, which is a collection of ancient Jewish writings not included in the biblical canon. It's a midrash written by our Jewish ancestors. And it expands on the Adam and Eve story. And it provides details about their life before and after Eden. Now, the passage I found most fascinating, very moving, was when Adam and Eve, they're exiled, and they're having the hardest of time adjusting to their life in the harshness outside of Eden. They didn't know how they could survive. So Adam pleads, tearful prayers. He asks the angels with him to intercede for him to God, to ask that they might go back to Eden for just one thing that would make life so much more pleasant and meaningful. That's it, to get this one thing and to bring it back. He wants to go back for some of the spices and the aromatic fragrances they found in paradise. The spices would be used for incense to enhance the sacrifices as a tribute to God and to flavor food. The prayer was granted. And thus, according to the Midrash, that's why we have spices in this world of ours. They represent a taste of Eden to elevate our human existence. It harkens to the spices we use at Havdalah, the concluding ceremony of Shabbat and later today, as we conclude Yom Kippur, the spices remind us that if we look for it, we can find a way to make differences in this world. Sometimes we have to plead and cry and search, but to find parcels of paradise for our lives and to help the lives of others. We should think that every act of tzedakah and charitable justice, every act of gimelut chasadim, every act of loving kindness, is like those spices from paradise. Just as Adam and Eve knew that spices were essential for reminding them of the sweetness of their origin, so every act of goodness brings hope and restores a sense of purpose and meaning for those who feel the world is but harsh and unyielding. Every kind act, every sweet gesture, every thoughtful gift of support is like the angelic gift that reestablished a reminder of Eden for those who feel lost and forgotten. God has given us the wherewithal 
to bring those blessings to our world. It is not enough to raise our voices in supplication to God to solve the ills of society. Rather, God has empowered us to bring healing and hope to the world. And I pray on this Yom Kippur, and following with the teaching of Isaiah, that is not the fasting or the prayers or the pounding of the chest that God seeks, but rather it's the act of justice and humility and looking to find security for those who feel insecure, that that is the Yom Kippur, and that is the deepest offering of our heart. I pray that each of us connects with the angelic role we can play to lift up the downtrodden, to feed the hungry, to find housing for the homeless, and to bring dignity to all. Ken may it be God's will.